Fetzas plays an important role in the governance and management of all schools in South Africa, in the sense that there are so many legal aspects and governance matters in education of which most principals and educators still have limited experience. It is important for a school to be a member of FETSAS as not only are we the leaders in school governance and management, but we also train, inform, guide and advise all our members in best practice and experienced solutions. Who is FETSAS? FETSAS is the national representative organization for school governing bodies. FETSAS informs, organizes, mobilizes and develops its members to achieve and maintain the highest international standards in school governance and management. We advise within the public and private educational sectors, focusing on the foundation, intermediate and senior phases. The school's governing body or SGB operates primarily outside the classroom. It is the SGB's task to make sure everything outside the classroom is in shape. That infrastructure, discipline, budgets, human resources and finances are efficiently managed. FETSAS can assist you with all the aspects of your school governing board's primary role, which is creating a conducive environment in the best interest of the school. Furthermore, FETSAS can assist in strategic planning, sound financial management and human resources aspects such as appointment, discipline and termination of contract processes. When dealing with appointments of principals, FETSAS wants to support you to appoint the best possible leadership candidates for your school, for the sake of our children. Be a part of FETSAS and know that you are part of a larger community that will always provide you with the latest information which is accurate and reliable. There is always someone within FETSAS who has the experience of past challenges and solutions. Simply a call away. We at FETSAS will walk alongside you to take your governing body forward to achieve greater heights. FETSAS has extensive experience in education matters. As an active, dynamic organization, it is fully informed of developments and restructuring in the education field and can advise its members accordingly. FETSAS is a democratic, non-political organization and members elect their leaders along the lines of the national school governing body elections. What does FETSAS stand for? FETSAS believes in maximum autonomy for governing bodies and therefore strives to expand governing bodies' rights, competencies and skills. FETSA supports and promotes governing bodies' powers and the rights as defined in the legal framework of the Constitution, South African Schools Act and acceptable governance principles. Former State President Nelson Mandela said, Education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Education is a great engine for personal development. Through education, the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor. Children of mine workers become heads of mines. The child of farm workers can become president of the country. Here at FETSAS, we do what we do because we love our children, we love our schools and we love our country. We look forward to being of service to every school governing body in South Africa. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ilse Willendahl, and I'm here in the Western Cape, and welcome to this session. Before I hand over to Rian van der Berg, who is going to lead this session, I just want to handle all the housekeeping. So let us start. Sorry, let me just get my... There you go. Sorry, let me just get that right. We've got a, a record number of registrants for this session. So if we don't get to your question, please contact Rian van der Berg. There at the bottom, I almost said Rian van der Walt again. At the bottom of the page, there's Rian's contact details, and he will either answer you or get you in touch with a, with a panelist that uh, it depends on the questions asked. And then also, um, this is Rian van der Berg. 
He's our deputy CEO and he's going to start this presentation. Rian, thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Um, I don't know what to call you. If you called me Van Berg, I must call you um, Ilse Van Seil or someone. Uh, just a little inside joke. Goedemiddag allemaal. Um, baie welkom bij ons sessie. This Tech Talk. It's Tech Talk uh, um, on Tuesday again at 3. Uh, we've been uh, on air a little bit less this term. It's been really busy, but there are so many pertinent issues that's uh, coming our way if we follow the news. Um, if you just blink, there's education news on, on the headlines. Uh, if it wasn't chat GPT earlier in the year and still continuing, suddenly polls hit us middle of May. And uh, yeah, I think if I look at the um, audience, so we're, we're going to be more, more in the English vein today. So uh, um, excuse us that we, we can't run the session twice. Today's topic. Why does it fit into the Center for Technology and why are we talking about it? Um, the results of what we do at school is a direct um, result, direct output of good governance and good management. Professional management, the school management team. Governance, the SGB, of which in most cases the management team is part of, the principal at least, ex officio. So, so what we do in school must render results on where we spend our time, our resources, and our money. And suddenly, the polls discussion was uh, yeah, dropped into to the media space. I want to share my screen quickly and just run through a few things. Uh, let me just share the screen before running the PowerPoint. Um, and just share a few thoughts um, as an opening. We've got two great guests today, um, Temba from Purple Mesh and Too Simple, and then Tanar from Snaplify. And we've been you know, partnering and working together with tech industry players over the past few years, bringing solutions to schools that fix real problems. <laughs> and solutions is the focus, not a product. So that's why we're talking with, with two great guests today. But just as an intro, I want to say, let's talk about polls, reading for meaning. What is it that, that we're actually trying to solve here? And uh, as a starter, let me just take this pain out of the um, view. As a starter, just one headline. International study reveals that eight out of 10 grade four pupils in South Africa can't read for meaning. Now that is scary. <laughs> that is a scary thought. But when I try to unpack it and frame it in a sense of what was it before, what should it be, where does it fit in, we're one of 50 countries that participated, one of two countries in Africa that participated, suddenly the data became more transparent and there's far more to it. Um, if I unpack it a little bit, reading in South Africa, let's just say it's not good, but on average, it's not good. <laughs> Uh, even if we moved up or down a little bit, we're on the wrong side of, of, of the scale here, moving from 76 to 81 to maybe something less. But we're in a bracket of where it's not good. We, we've got more learners not reading for meaning than we have for meaning on average. But what did we expect? Um, I think this study was done 2022 or 2021. No, might be 2020. And that's the year that the pandemic hit us. So did we expect to be better than the previous 2016 results? And is it a shock to be at 81% when we were at 76 previously? Uh, then I want to ask a question. Is COVID the culprit? I don't know. How can we be on the bad side of the scale before COVID and suddenly post COVID, there's a little trend that goes the wrong way and now everything is COVID's problem. I'm not saying that COVID did not disrupt, but I'm thinking that maybe we should look at some fundamentals and not just say, well, if we catch up from COVID, we're in good shape. And then the question about the data is, are we all in the same boat? And uh, I'm just leaving those questions there. I want to speak a little bit about data. You've heard me many times talking about technology. Now, technology is not just a flavor of the month or something that we need to use or part of this world that we live in. It's all those as well. But the true value of technology, for me, lies in the fact that we have data. <laughs> technology generates a lot of data. If all of you do this, um, don't know which side you wear your watch on, a lot of you will look down and see, but I've got a very expensive computer, not a watch, on my wrist, that gives 
my medical aid a lot of data that helps me train, that gives me a lot of information. And without doing anything different in life, we generate data. So the value of data is what I want to talk about in this frame of polls. And other speakers, speakers will talk a little bit about some of the other elements of that. But 81% front page of the newspaper, and suddenly it just means one thing. But there's difference between average and granular. Uh, you see the blood pressure uh, picture, uh, monitor picture there, I always <laughs> tell our team, uh, if you just look at the average, on average, South Africa has a very healthy blood pressure of 120 over 80, but there's still people daily um, having heart attacks, <laughs> having blood pressure issues. So you've got to go from average to the granular and look at individual context, individual um, cases. The collection of data. We've got to collect far more data, but sometimes we just do what we do without collecting data. We stop what we do, and then we've got to do a report. The opposite of what our smart watches and our phones do. Um, and, and I want to put that to our guest speakers, <laughs> who's going to talk a little bit about some of the solutions they might have that collect data that can see so that we can put diagnostics in place for the purpose of this discussion about data is the value of data gives us the ability to take good decisions. And uh, I will yeah, get to the end of this as well. If we know where it's dry, water there. But if we water all over, even where it's wet, we might just drown the plants. So, so we've got to think about it. Just a little story that made data easy for me. Top picture, that's data. A lot of just colors and blocks and everything in a heap. Yes, we've got data. If we sort it, we see how much we've got in yellow and blue and red. If we arrange it, oh, now we see yellow is more than blue, and but it's still not telling a story. If we present it visually, suddenly we see we've got pie charts and bar charts and everything. But the true value of the data is the story that it explains. <laughs> so all those blocks can tell a story. And that's what I want to do with pills a little bit today. So the pull story for me is 81%. Is it good or bad? If we just look at the absolute value, I'm saying it's bad because I think more kids at the age 10 should be able to read than, than the ones that shouldn't. But we look at an absolute value and we don't know what to compare it with. If we look at it compared to 2011, we see that the trend uh, has improved and suddenly gone the other way around again. But we might have expected that given that the COVID uh, disruption was heavy on the vulnerable people in the country. So it's it's possibly a good thing that we're only at 81, although it's never a good thing. But we could have been at 90, given how, how uh, drastic the pandemic was. But we should not just look at that and say, okay, we'll, we'll just turn the trend around. Where should we be? We compare the number with others. And in the 50 countries that participated, we are the worst. But there are a lot of countries that did not participate. That doesn't make us better, but we've got to benchmark and see because our kids are going to compete in the marketplace with international kids at some point in time in their lives. So we've got to know where we pitch in the benchmark. And then compared granularly into the other provinces, other contexts, and there's some details. So I want to urge you guys, get the report. Don't just look at the headline. And then the challenge for your school, uh, for your SGB, for your bestuur span, for your Class what is your school's number? <laughs> it's all good and well to say we're in South Africa and 81% is South Africa. But at your school, it might be 60, it might be 12, it might be something else. But do you know what the data says about your school? Um, Pearl's story, just wise, I don't know, could, could this be? And I'm not saying this is the answer, but uh, hearing the minister talk, she's very strong about mother tongue instruction. Uh, we see the pictures of classrooms being overcrowded. Uh, we are concerned about infrastructure. Could that play a role? Traveling time to school, teaching methodologies, reading culture. Do parents read? <laughs> do we read to our children? Or do we all just watch videos? And then critical one, access to books. And I'm going to ask Tana to talk about that at some point in time. Um, I'm going to skip this and, and end with this. I'm going to lead in. Uh, stop sharing my screens now. If you can uh, come onto stage, if that is a way to put it, open up your video. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you to maybe just uh, from Snaplify's point of view, Tana is the sales manager at Snaplify. It's online reading, online reader app, uh, lots of resources available. Snaplify has something 
beautiful. It's been available for many years, a free library, and I want you to talk about that. But there's something else about diagnostics. There's something else about reading culture. Um, how can you, from Snatley Fire's point of view, speak into this space and possibly mm -hmm. assist our schools in going forward? Uh, I'm going to allow you to do a little presentation and then we'll take questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rian. I'm just sharing my screen. There we go. You're good. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rian. Good afternoon, everyone. We are really excited to be a part of this webinar. And as Rian has mentioned, you know, reading is such an important aspect, I think, at schools, especially, you know, whenever we uh, work with the school or we meet with the school, it's the one main area that we generally discuss and that comes up. Um, as a point of importance. And um, at Snaplify Reading, it's really close to our hearts. We, and I'm sure that everyone else in this webinar is um, at the same point. So I might be uh, preaching to the converted. But thanks so much, Rian. Um, my presentation today will speak exactly to everything that you've just mentioned. So I'll jump right into it. Um, so when we meet with the school, the first thing we do is we try to we, we ask a few questions, and that is just to gain an understanding of the current lead, reading landscape at the school. So what are the current reading strategies that are employed at the school? Um, what are the barriers to reading that they're experiencing? Accessibility, as you've mentioned, Diane, and then the important thing is metrics and analytics, because that will give us, you know, and, and it will give teachers, educators, everyone, all stakeholders at the school an understanding of um what the requirements are and what that will inform the solution and the treating, teaching strategies going forward. So the basic premise is that we're really trying to, you know, whenever we meet with the school, one of the key things is to grow a reading culture and especially grow a reading, uh, a culture of reading for understanding. Um, so or reading, uh, reading with comprehension and to help learners become lifelong readers. So even if we look at just improving the children's reading from five minutes to 20 minutes every day, it makes a massive difference in the vocabulary and then in their performance and assessments. So just a, a few fundamentals of um, one of the reading programs that we offer. And when, it, when we do assist schools with reading strategies, there are a few key areas that we look at. So the first is that, you know, reading comprehension really impacts every area of academic achievement. And it affects every curriculum subject, you know, when a student is given a summary or an activity or a textbook to read, it's very important that they are actually not just that they can read the text, but are they understanding the instruction? Are they understanding what they are reading? You know, traditionally, the responsibility of growing and reading comprehensions has fallen on the librarian or the language department. But we know the reality is that reading really improves performance in all subjects. So we can draw the conclusion that if we can improve reading um, comprehension, we can improve the results of learners across the school and then contribute to um, the academic success of learners in the classroom. And then the second image, there's no real shortcuts to grow, you know, reading comprehension. Once a child is past the foundation phase and has generally learned the ABCs and phonics, then the only way to improve reading comprehension is essentially just to read more. And um, however, and often overlooked, the element is that children need to be reading on the critic level. And I'll go into this in the next few slides. And then the last point is, you know, once they're reading more, we know that they're going to have a higher level, I would say, of content knowledge, and then just perform better, not only in school, but generally in life. And so one of the um, keys to success, we believe, is being able to get the children reading on their correct reading level. So not based on what their age is or their grade is, but where are they on their reading journey? And research has shown that to grow reading comprehension, we're really aiming to get, you know, to a 75% comprehension level. And now there's nothing wrong with them reading and enjoying a book that is too easy, except that it doesn't really stretch their comprehension abilities. So um, we would say, you know, anything below 75%, that's okay. But is it stretching the reading um, with comprehension? And on the other hand, if a child is understanding less than 75% of what they're reading, this is often where we see children developing, I would say, a bad connotation with reading or a bad identity as a reader. And that starts as early as grade four, you know, when they are actually exposed to reading. 
and that is cemented in their minds. So students will either say things like, I'm not a reader, I belong on the sports field, or, you know, reading's too difficult, it's not the thing for me. But it's only because they were they might have been exposed to a book or um, a reading level that is just not on their level. And then so what we do is we use the Lexile system at Snaplify as a reading metric. And I'm not sure, it's been around since the 80s. It was developed by a company, I think, called Metametrics, and it's used all across the world. Um, and so basically what we do is the Lexile framework or the Lexile level measures where they are at on the reading journey. So not what the grade or the age is, but, um, and it also, what it does is it measures the text that they're reading according to their level and it matches the two. Um, and it identifies, you know, what one of the, the programs that we offer is we identify that Lexile level and we match the book that is perfect for their reading level. Um, and so there are different Lexile levels that we use. And the great thing about it is that because it's well researched, it provides the school with solid metrics that they are able to gauge where the reader, what the reader is reading against. So um, as an example, if we have a grade 11 child, you know, sitting with a 900 Lexile level, and they are hoping to go to university in two years time, then as a teacher, you can see that at university level, they should be reading at this level. How can we intervene to get them to that space? So that's where data comes in. So like you mentioned earlier, um, Leanne, it's using those metrics and that insights analytics to inform teaching strategies and um, assist learners. And my presentation covers, I would say, all stakeholders that when um, involved in reading. So the students, the educators, and the parents. Now, um, for educators, we believe, and this is also based on the schools that we've worked with, is that to effectively um, drive a reading strategy and foster cult culture of reading, we do, you know, teachers play a vital part. And so it needs to be easy and um, it needs to, because as we know, teachers already have so much on their plate. There are so many things that they need to be taken into consideration. And so um, the solutions that we offer needs to be able to fit into that. Um, and so what we've also noticed is one of the big challenges about manual individual reading assessments is the time that it consumes. And so we believe it needs to be easy, it needs to be effective, it needs to empower the educators, you know, fast, and it needs to be accurate. And so um, we think, you know, metrics, very important to monitor key performance data, use that data to um, drive a reading strategy at school, track proficiencies, um, the fact, you know, that teachers can have access to all of these insights and analytics, we believe that that is vital. And then accessibility, you know, do students at schools, what do they, do they have access to reading resources? Um, and as you mentioned, uh, Rian, our digital library gives uh, students, educators, gives everyone at the school access to over 40,000 free resources. And this covers a variety of genres. It covers a variety of ages and different languages as well. And it's free. It's freely accessible. Anyone can register and immediately start accessing these books. So this breaks down the barrier to accessibility. How do you, um, yeah. So can I quickly, quickly interrupt there? Oh. I, th I think that's important. The free access creates access but it's mm -hmm. not a printed book. So we've got 40,000 books in a free library to a school, mm -hmm. um, but one needs either data to download <laughs> or data to read and a device yes. to access. Yes. Um, what are you guys seeing as far as access to art? We just mm -hmm. don't have to, for, for all the stats, but there's one school of thought that says no one in the country has access to data, you know, like mm -hmm. 10%. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. there's... The Hootsuite uh, report that came out and this is there, there are double the smart devices in the country than there are people, you know, so 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 somewhere in between we've oh, got please. levels of access, but just so that the, the audience know, the 40,000 mm -hmm. free books, and I reiterate free books, makes it free to read, but books yes. are still expensive, but the devices, what are you seeing and how do you bridge the digital divide? Mm -hmm. So... At Snapify, any of the schools that are using us, there is a minimum specification in terms of devices. 
the Snapify reader application, and this is where they will, the reading is done. So this is where they would access any of those three books that they have checked out of the library. Um, this is free for download. It works on any operating system and any device. So whether you're using a mobile phone, and we know most students have cell phones these days, a desktop, desktop or a tablet or a laptop, there's a version applicable for all of those. And once the content is downloaded to the reader app, it allows for offline reading. So students and educators don't need constant um, access to internet connectivity in order to read these books. It allows offline reading, so the students will only need access to the internet, which they can do at, um, at school, download the content, and once it's downloaded, they can read it offline. Thanks, I'm covered. Perfect. And then another way in which we have um, incorporated Lexile levels is once the students know what their unique reading level is, they can use that in the library to search for the books according to their reading level. Teachers can also recommend titles according to students' reading levels. So that's another way that the importance that we believe the knowing what their reading level is or their Lexile level, they can then search for books according to it. So it's part of our um, advanced search functions. So students can type in what their Lexile level is and it will bring up all the books that is on their reading level. Okay, and then just as, as I've mentioned with the reader application, it allows for offline reading, it is easily accessible, and students can, there's a range of functionality to assist them um, with reading their books in the reader application. Things like they can make highlights, notes, they can bookmark. And another key um, feature that we are very excited about is there is dyslexic font as well. So students with any reading disabilities, the reader application um, allows for that as well. So there's dyslexic font as well as text-to-speech functionality. And then um, the importance, and I think one of the ways in which the solutions that we offer support schools is by gamifying reading via incentives. So um, teachers will have access to all of these analytics and metrics. And what they can do is they can incentivize reading in the classroom. So they can either use, you know, reading charts in the classroom. Um, we know there's one school that has actually um, had grade five learners. There were a few grade five students that have read up to 30 books in one term. So in one term, they've read up to 30 books because of the, because of the, the how the um, reading culture was fostered in the school. So students, um, the, the teachers can generate certificates they can generate reports. One of the ways in which the schools um, in, uh, foster this is by either assemblies or once a quarter, they hand out these certificates. You know, this student has read this amount of books. This student has read this amount of words. So that way you kind of include the learners and you make it exciting for them. And I think when students feel that they are, you know, the books that have been recommended is according to their interests and according to their unique reading level, it makes it fun, you know, it makes it inclusive. And students are actually get excited about reading. And this is how I think um, the school can play a part in fostering that love for reading. Um, and yeah, that's the only thing. And then the other stakeholder that I want to mention is parents. So there's just a bit of stats there that we've, we've picked up is um, it's, it's, we always think it's valuable to close the loop between families at the school to grow a reading culture. Um, as we know, you know, reading starts at home. So our platforms also generates a reading report that can be shared with parents, and that kind of closes the loop. So the reality is that most reading is going to happen at home, and it's very important that the parents are on board as well. Um, I think it's a valuable tool for teachers to use in parent-teacher meetings. Um, and, you know, as a teacher, you can look at the reading report, you can share that with the parents and say, um, you know, we, we've noticed that your child has only read two books this term. What are the strategies that you are employing at home? And um, it's just a great way, I think, to include parents on that journey as well. And that's it from me. Any questions? So now we've got a question in the um, chat box on the Q&A. Mm. If you could just answer that and tick answer to all. 
It's just where do we get the link to the um, free library, the Engage platform. So if you can share that with, with the audience. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I think we'll get to Q&A in a, in a short while as well. Uh, I want to <laughs> request the audience or, or push them. So if you've got questions, just load it in the Q&A box. We'll try and get to them. We also had a lot of questions come in before time. Temba, I'm going to ask you to, to open your uh, microphone in your video. Um, Tanaya is not stepping away. Uh, she's going to sit in the wings until we, until we get to Q&A. Uh, Temba is the business development manager. Um, Tanaya, you can possibly mute your, your uh, system. Uh, Tempa is the business development manager at Purple Mesh. Tana spoke about one strong shareholder or stakeholder being the parent. Um, I've spoken about the uh, SGB and the school management team's role. It's not just the learner's role, but something that I've seen in Purple Mesh, uh, which is a too simple product, is the fact that teachers need to be superheroes. <laughs> teachers Absolutely. Are, teachers are required to come to come to school with their capes on and be very individual, be very personalized, be yes. everything to everyone. And what I like about Too Simple, and I encountered them uh, in the UK at the Bet Show as well. They've got a strong presence in South Africa. But you guys make life easier for teachers in the class. How do Absolutely. you time how do we be more efficient and more effective in class um, what can too simple add to this conversation uh, about data about reading comprehension about writing about spelling and about making teachers lives easier amazing thank you so much uh, rian for the opportunity welcome everybody thank you so much that we can get to be here and uh, just uh, just add a little bit of what we've been doing with our schools and so because everybody knows me uh, as rian has already introduced me from T simple um and one thing that i'd like to just mention and i hope that everybody can see my screen rian can you just confirm there on your side if you it's are able to see coming my back screen. again okay it's, it's coming, coming back, back again there we go they know there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Rian. Uh, so just as uh, Rian mentioned, uh, Too Simple as a UK-based company, we are we are representing here, representing South Africa uh, here in Joburg, um, head office here in Joburg. But um, just to quickly dive into what we quickly do and come back to the tangible or, or tangent uh, topic of, of, of what we're discussing today. Um, and so we do offer a virtual learning environment called uh, Purple Mash. And uh, that platform comes with our mini mash and serial mash platforms. And it is focused, uh, it's, it's, it's mainly focused on the pedagogical needs of a teacher within the classroom. And so what's amazing is that we've worked with, we have partnered with Snapify as well to really go further and assist and help our schools in terms of their educational needs in the classroom. And not just the teachers, but what's very much important is to make sure that you give a tool or a product or activity uh, or resource or materials to a student that's actually uh, conducive to their learning uh, in, in today's age. And so um, just to quickly talk about Purple Mash quick, and then I'll be talking about Serial Mash, which is the reading side of uh, uh, <clears throat> of our, our, our product, and also just to talk about how it actually helps teachers in terms of the, uh, the edtech adoption within the classroom. And so uh, what we have is an amazing interactive learning environment called Purple Mash that fully uh, supports the curriculum as well. Um, and then also provides interactive tools and activities uh, across all subjects as well, economically designed for your primary schools. And what's amazing is that because I used to be a teacher myself, teachers are uh, absolutely thrown a lot with administrative work. And so we try to always minimize that. And so you'll see that they already made uh, teaching worksheets and printable resources as well uh, within Purple Mash. And what's amazing is that students love games. We are they're all born with these devices, absolutely born with devices. And so there is a part of game-based learning in there as well. And the accessibility of this platform is just so easy because we do also have an app out and as well as uh, the, the original web-based platform that it has. And it's built in LMSs. But um, just to quickly move a little bit along and into uh, the important part of how we help schools. So the integration from 
platform. The back end is really, really good. We, we integrate it with a lot of platforms and programs as well. And we also have our app. And so in terms of just the infrastructure, maybe you're thinking already, okay, great. Tim is now setting us up as to how, uh, how uh, Purple Mash is amazing and how Serial Mash will actually cater to the reading and comprehension part uh, within the classroom and for our students. Um, but first and foremost, Purple Mash in itself um, has economically designed tools for education for you and also teacher resources for you. And as I mentioned in the activities for student learning um, and some activities in there. But let's now move a little bit more into the reading and comprehension part and how one needs to understand. And I love what Ruan, what you mentioned and as well as Tana mentioned that uh, we all actually need to just kind of understand that information and knowledge is power. And, and how, how we get to that is the process of cultivation and how do we help and teach our kids to acquire the necessary skills skills, uh, such as helping them uh, grow their motor skills or learn how to write. And we, from, from, from an educational perspective in Purple Mash, um, we do foster or help uh, 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 teachers foster that, that edtech way of using technology in the classroom, but also uh, giving them the way to still stay to the old school pen and paper. And what's amazing is that the con there, is, there is a good combination of how teachers can use Purple Mash within the classroom um, to actually kind of achieve that, that that goal and so the purple mash uh, language tool that we have really help teachers cultivate those skills uh, 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 in 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 students for them to understand okay before um <clears throat> Before I actually can just consume information, it's also very important to kind of uh, be able to create, yeah, create, but at the same time uh, have that critical thinking approach, or and have and 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 ignite that creativity as well. Because you never know the kind of students you have in your classroom. You never know that you have a Steve Jobs in your classroom. You just never know. And so the the amazing purple uh, purple mash language tools really help uh, teachers to 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 let students create their own stories, uh, to uh, give them a, a much more, for lack of word, dumb down version of a word processing tool to help their writing skills uh, as well. And uh, what's amazing about Purple Mash that what schools have access to as well is our Serial Mash product. And this is where um, I'm going to make it tangible to everybody. Uh, and what's amazing is our online library that we have. Um, and what it is, is that it is a, it's a reading and comprehension package um, that our schools have access to. And where we have a library of a variety of different uh, uh, compiled books um, that uh, that we are making available to our schools and over 250 books for all primary school ages. And what's amazing is we've recently also signed a partnership with uh, DK Books, uh, um, Dorling Kindersley Books. And a lot of our schools, a lot of our teachers are quite familiar with these books and they are really uh, enjoying them and loving them. And what's amazing is our schools and our students have full access to these uh, books. But what's amazing about these books is that on selective books, there are uh, immersive readers included in them, which I will also showcase for you. And also teachers are able to assign books to their students, either maybe the entire book or a specific chapter. Um, and teachers are able to actually, um, uh, what do you call it, um, assess their progress and see actually how far have they read and where they may be struggling as well. And what's amazing is that within each book, there are built-in activities, um, writing activities, and also guided reading uh, resources in there. But also to take a little bit further, some of these books, because obviously we want to cater and we want to bring this product to all of our schools, is that you don't want to limit some schools that are saying, Timber, uh, we actually need we need tangible, like a, a, a real, uh, you know, printed out book. What's amazing is that uh, our books are also printable as well, which is not something that you see when it comes to a digital uh, textbook that uh, you have access to. Um, and so, as I mentioned, teachers will have access to these books, and so they will be age recommendations. What's amazing is that teachers are all the only ones that are that will see these age recommendations. Uh, students won't see these. Um, and what's amazing is that uh, teachers are can, as I mentioned, they can assign their books. Uh, um, uh, chapters to their students and students themselves can go into Serial Mash and access books, all the books in there, uh, as I mentioned, with the immersive uh, reader uh, built in. 
And what's amazing about uh, Serial Mash is that it plugs in with Purple Mash, as I mentioned. And uh, all these books, and just to, just to show you guys a little bit how Serial Mash would look like, and I will uh, go over and give you guys a proper uh, thorough demo as well, uh, just so you can see how it looks. But these icons on these books, as I mentioned, the selective books are immersive readers. And just like uh, as Tanam mentioned that these, these supplementary features in books are, are really, really helpful uh, towards the users. Um, and also, What's amazing is, as I mentioned, to, to track that student progress, Purple Mash has an entire built-in uh, data uh, feature that tracks students' uh, uh, reading and uh, teachers are able to go in or impersonate students rather to actually see, um, to monitor their reading. But also what's amazing is this, uh, as you mentioned, Rian, in the beginning, that they, so the stakeholders such as parents, which play a big part um, in, in, in a school adoption uh, a journey. And, and what's amazing is uh, parents are able to actually manually enter uh, their reading journals as well. So if, if, if parents are, uh, are and not if uh, a lot of our parents, which is amazing, and, and, and schools are pulling parents more, uh, even more in, uh, is that uh, 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 parents are able to assist um, their teachers um, in, in terms of taking their students and cultivating those reading and, uh, and comprehension skills. And so parents can then uh, add manually the books in here as well so that uh, teachers can see, oh, so there's actually other books that um, students are also reading. And, and how you do that is just a very easy manual of using just the, the ISBN code as well of any book that is out there. Um, and that's what one part of, of Serial Match that's really, really amazing. Okay, so just to show you guys now the amazing platform uh, of this. So I'm in Purple Mash already. And just to quickly show you a little bit more of Serial Mash and, uh, and I'll conclude, is this the reading section. So in, in, in Purple Mash, we've got four main reading areas or learning areas rather. And then we've got a reading section and I'll click on it. And in there is where you, is how teachers and students access uh, Serial Mash. But in there as well are built in tools and reading journals and, and, and uh, <clears throat> also writing projects, many, many other resources. But let's quickly open up Serial Mash. So just to save on, on internet, I already opened up the tabs. I've already prepared it for us. And so just to give you guys some visual aid as to what do teachers see and how do you, uh, and, and also what do you do, 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 um, a student see, is here I've gone ahead, I've went into a library quickly, and uh, I've chosen uh, one of our books here. And uh, before we open the book itself, I just want to quickly scroll a little bit downwards and just showcase and show you how those interactive activities are actually embedded within each book. And now remember, as a teacher, this is not just reading for your students, but they are engaging a much more uh, uh, deeper into that book um, and, their, and their knowledge is, is also tasted. And Rian, you mentioned earlier that, um, the, the, you know, looking at, this, at this, uh, the statistic and how reading and, and, and comprehension is so is, is such a difficult skill for our students. And what's amazing is this will force them then to engage more with the content of the book and their knowledge as to what they've read um, uh, is, is tested. And what's amazing is that teachers don't have to create these resources. They're already created. They're already ready for the teacher to assign uh, their students. And I'm talking about open-ended questions. There's sequencing in there. There's also spelling punctuation and grammar activities built into uh, Serial Mash as well to help foster uh, those necessary uh, reading comprehension uh, skills. And now let's go ahead for the last part, but not least, just to showcase this. I know, guys, I don't have much time, but uh, just to show you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open up a book. And as, it's open, as the book opens at the bottom, you'll see the bar uh, for the immersive reader that is built in. And I will just go ahead and click on the book. At this moment, all of you are seeing the font. And Rian, if you can just nod there, that you can see my book there, amazing. But what if you are visually impaired? Netos Akvan, Akadro, Fir so four eyes. What you'll do is then you'll move up your mouse. And what's amazing is a toolbar will appear at the top. And you'll get a gear icon. And then the user can go and uh, you can remove or omit the audio bar. Uh, if students are using tablets, they can also uh, enable scrolling. This is just the, 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 the user friendliness uh, of, of uh, a serial mash. And what's amazing is that, as I mentioned, if, uh, you, if as, as a student, if you are now uh, visually, I wouldn't say now visually impaired, but if you can't see nicely there, uh, you can actually make the font even bigger as well. Um, and Tanar mentioned as well that the, the, your fonts are very, very important. And we also include a, ver a variety of different fonts here, open um, dyslexic uh, font, which is a very good font that really helps uh, students to 
read better and as well as Poppins. A lot of our primary schools love the Poppins font as well. And what's amazing is you are able to also go and change the background of your book as well, just to give you those, that personal preference. And because it's very important to, to as, as I mentioned in, in the beninging, <laughs> to, to provide your students with a conducive learning, either a tool or resource or, or place them in a, in a conducive uh, learning environment. And, and you're looking at, at, at all of your four pillars as well, that uh, the, the whole purple mash and soul mashing campuses. Um, and then last but not least, as I mentioned, there is you are able to go ahead and print out the book as well. And so um, to, to all the, the our, 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 our teachers and, and, and fellow uh, school leaders, um, what's amazing about this is that everybody has or you are now exposed to an amazing uh, 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 what you call a variety of products and services and and we are so glad that we we, we get to partner uh, with Fed says and as well as Naplify to really help and reach out to our schools and, and find out how we can support our schools in this journey and and uh, as and as you mentioned uh, um, Rian that you don't you don't want to focus on on really like the the bigger picture but I always have this saying that says we cannot change the world but we can definitely change someone's world and 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 uh, Rome was never built in one day and so uh, for, for for those that are like to know more about us, we'd love to to help you uh, and 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 walk a journey with um uh, um uh, with you as we are working a journey with all of our schools. Um and yeah, if there's any other questions, please let me know. But uh, you're more than welcome to go ahead and scan that QR code as well. If you want to reach out to us, and you can also simply email me as well. But just uh yeah, from our side, thank you for that. I really hope that was helpful for you there, Rian, and for everybody else as well. And um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Temba. I know uh, you're rushing <laughs> at 100 miles an hour the audience. Yes, yes. I, I always think yes. we, 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 we want to make it engaging and, and deliver some content, but it's slightly overwhelming. Uh, everyone will get a recording of this uh, session, so you can share it with everyone in your team at school. And we will also share some um, information packs with the email that goes to it. And even if you're watching this in not in real time, uh, I know a lot of people register to get it on YouTube. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be worthwhile putting Timba on 1.5 times the speed because he, he probably spoke at 1.5 times the speed. Um, Timba, if you can stop sharing your screen, I just want to open up for the, the Q&A. Um, there we go. Uh, Tana, you can open up your camera and Timber, you can open up your camera. I wanted to, to spend some time on what we do now. Um, and there's some questions, uh, Tana answered quite a few questions there. Uh, a very pertinent question was, where do we get, um, engage? Uh, and then the language question and not just Afrikaans English, English language. I know that there's a lot of resources. Maybe you could just answer that one, uh, yeah. uh Snaplify resources in, in other languages. Yes, thanks, Leanne. Um, so to register your school and access the digital library, registration is absolutely for free. So anyone can go to the link that I shared in the Q&A section. You can click on it. It takes you three minutes. You register and you immediately get access to all of the free resources. And then on the question on the languages, we have resources for all South African languages. So um, any language, any genre, any reading level, it is available in the Snaplify Digital Library. There's about just over 40,000 free resources. And these are literary reading material, past exam papers, certain academic resources. And then there's an additional collection that can be purchased from. And the cost varies as well. So you get books from the you know, from local publishers as well as international publishers that are available in our catalog. Very good. Now, I'm quickly browsing through the questions. It seems like Ooh. Tim just lost connection. I don't know what's happening, where he's staying, but it could be load shedding or, or some sort of issue there. Um, I want to add a little bit to the conversation and, and the reason why we're having this talk today, and we'll jump into the questions uh, very shortly. And if you want to put your eye on the questions and see if there's anything relevant um, the question today is, can technology assist in this reading crisis? Uh, I think the first one is, can assist to tell us if there is a crisis at my school and who has the crisis, not everyone, <laughs> and what is the crisis, at what level is it? So, so I'm saying if we start doing some diagnostics, which both Timber and, and Tana spoke about, I think we can 
sniper fire pinpoint our resources to the problematic areas. But I also want to say that I think, and I know good teachers know who the problem, uh, where the problem lies with which learners. So we must not just take the technology, but add technology to the professional job, the professional nature of being a, a, a good teacher, but also use the resources to lighten the load. Um, so yes, tech and reading, I think very, very critical. In the world that we're living in, and, and we can speak about this quickly tonight, reading oh. versus listening, uh, you have the text to speech that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I've got an add in, an extension in my, uh, and, and I'm not going to showcase it now, in my um, Chrome browser, where I highlight a paragraph, click read me, and it reads it out to me. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes to save time, <laughs> to rest my eyes, or to follow where I'm reading. Um, so, so text to speech, does that have, have an effect on learning pronunciation, seeing the word? I know that English is not a very phonetical uh, language. My kids always ask me, what is thou, though, they, and through, and all these things are different, but now you hear someone speak it. Maybe just add some text to speech and the value of that. Hmm. Um, so the schools that we work with, it's just an additional feature for students with, you know, reading disabilities or um, it's it's all inclusive, basically. So, as I mentioned, the dyslexic font that um, that assists with 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 that one issue. And then the text to speech is, as you mentioned, maybe, you know, the student is driving on the way home or they're busy doing something else and they'd like to, you know, listen, because I know I do that. While I'm busy doing a mundane task, I listen to something, an audio book. We offer those on the platform as well, so you'll have access to audio books. But um, yes, it allows for, for that feature as well. Whether it has an impact on reading, I can't really say. I don't think I'm an authority in that field to say, you know, how it affects. But what I would say is that it allows for, um, for all of those types of uses, basically. The next, the next one is possibly uh, reading versus viewing. And I'm very controversial in this because I've done some research to see the Im immense international explosion of consumption of video. Mm. This session is video. <laughs> we could actually turn on um, subtitles in Zoom and people will be able to read what we, what we say. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so reading versus listening or listening, you know, looking at the words while someone is speaking it, there's, there's some element to it, but also call it subtitles, um, YouTube, Netflix, uh, anything with subtitles, um, it tends to pull your eyes towards it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 that's that's a very controversial thing to say. But if we watch a video, can we read? Watch a movie? Can we read the movie? Can we read the text? Um, and and I want to maybe focus on something that I saw in the UK, um, and maybe get your thoughts on that. I just want to share my screen quickly if I can mm. just jump to that. It's something called Tots, the Tots Foundation, and it is turn on the subtitles. And if you go and view this, now this is international trends and tools, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but mm. everyone worldwide is trying to fix this problem. <laughs> and um, so turn on the subtitles is a foundation, um, someone Warren, I can't remember his first name now, where they say, just turn on the subtitles on TV and Netflix and that kind of thing, and kids will tend to learn to read quicker because they follow mm. the story. Um, but they read 100 words on the screen or 200 words on the screen whilst they're watching the little sitcom or something. Mm, mm. Uh, so yes, turn on the subtitles, maybe just a comment on that text-to-speech we've touched. Video, mm. YouTube, you can have subtitles. Zoom, you can have subtitles. Mm. PowerPoint, teachers, if you do PowerPoint and you talk while you're showcasing the PowerPoint, it will, especially the English one is good, it will transcribe while you're talking and, and fairly accurately and make a video for that. And then something new that we're not going to spend time on now is Spritzlet, which is a new method of reading. I don't know if you've seen or heard that, but go Google that one. Um, but your thoughts on, on subtitles mm. and improving reading? Temba, there's a few questions in the Q&A box if you can maybe jump in there and just answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, yeah, maybe. maybe a Amazing. Thing. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we're good. Yes. Mm. Yeah, um, I think, Leanne, again, my personal opinion, I would say, Number one, they are susceptible to the grammar, you know, of the person that is speaking. So that is a subtitle. I know because I use it as well. 
sometimes if you're watching a video and you're in a crowded space and you don't want to, you, you, you'd rather just use the subtitles. Um, I think number one, it's, it's that, it's the grammar, it's the way in which words are used. Are they actual words or are they slang or made up words? And then number two, I think the attention span. And I think that, that, that links into, to videos for me. I mean, there's so much video going around and it just, it shortens the attention span. And I, I, I think for, for kids, that is, I, I, I would say for myself, my personal opinion is that, um, uh, just the attention span is already so short, you know, and we, they are being, um, exposed to all of these things with short little videos, short bursts of things. And it kind of, it does mold the way they see things and how they, um, they respond to certain things. And I just think, you know, reading should be reading where you are reading on a page and that sort of thing. I think if it's necessary at some point, then yes, but I wouldn't say as um, a strategy going forward. Maybe I can ask the audience and we don't have a poll running, we can just answer in the yeah. <laughs> Q&A. Um, the, the Center for Technology's slogan for the last few years have been, we should learn as we live. Now, learning is a process and there's a big debate on <laughs> um, read learn to read so that you could read to learn but we can learn a lot of things without with, without the a middle step uh because people can teach us and we can experience so reading is important but it's not the only way that we can learn but we say learn as we live and to the audience maybe do you read at all on screens if i ask, ask an audience in a hall i say who reads the newspaper on their phone Maybe, maybe let's just see, see by raise of hands, just go to the, to the reaction um, and we'll see the number of hands fly. Who reads the newspaper or news articles on their phone or on their computer? There's thumbs up, thumbs up, plenty thumbs up coming. Um, this is where we're actually consuming our news mm -hmm. from. Yeah, the thumbs are coming big time. <laughs> um, 10 years ago, we would have read the news in the newspaper but it would have been stale news by 10 o'clock because by now the news is fresh by 10 o'clock if it was a six o'clock delivery of the newspaper. Yep, thanks. I would say that's about 100 thumbs already there. Um, yeah. so we, we, we do consume information for reading pleasure or for proper work, the news might be your, your job, on our screens. And yet we might be slightly conscious and scared of using technology in school learners reading eyes tablet time screen time all that kind of thing um how do we mitigate and manage the risks of that so that we get the both the best of the both worlds we're reading but reading on glass is still reading or or am i saying it wrong Temba, you, you you nod your head there say phone speaking yeah ex-teacher uh, very passionate about <laughs> education. Yeah, but no. Yeah. Are we, too um, scared of, are we too scared of the screen or do we just need to manage it better? And now I'll get your comment and input on that as well. Yeah, I think uh, um, the, the word, the key concept in, in that approach is balance. And I think that uh, as long as we understand that balance is the most important aspect to kind of understand that Digitally, that's where we're moving in into. It's that most things are digitized. Um, you're looking also at how schools save costs on paper is that they would rather consider having digital textbooks. But I think just finding that balance in going back to the drawing board and still having activities that, that pertains to that um, where learning is a little bit different as well because reading is not just... Uh, Timba, we're, we're losing you a little bit. <laughs> it's a connectivity issue. Yeah, it's got a connectivity. So now mm. I, I think mm. you spoke about balance and, mm. and using tools. Your, your, your thoughts yeah. and comments? I mean, I definitely agree. And uh, a lot of the time, you know, that is a, um, a objection, I would say, that is raised with schools where they either believe that, you know, kids spend already so much time on screens every single day. They shouldn't have the textbooks on the screen as well. And, and I think as... Timba said, you know, balance, balance is key. And I like to look at the benefits that digital offers then in that way. And then you weigh it up in that way. So if you look at the benefits, as an example, um, students, you know, I think back in, in, in my day when I was at school, I would have 10 textbooks as well as my workbooks in a bag on my back and I'll carry it to school 
you know, the, with the device, students can add all of their textbooks on their device and carry it on the device and everything is available there. Um, there are things like, you know, video that can be linked into a textbook, resources that teachers have shared that can be linked to a text into a textbook as well. Um, and then in terms of just the insights and analytics it gives to schools. So things that physical books schools wouldn't have access to, you know, with digital textbooks, a school can, you know, have a look and see how have these students, when have they opened their textbooks? How long have they spent, you know, on their textbooks? What times were they logging in? Have they actually engaged with their textbooks using highlights or have they made notes in their textbooks? These are things you wouldn't generally as a school have access to with a hard copy book, whereas digital gives you access to these sort of, you know, solutions and things as well. So that's how I like to measure it up, you know, the pros versus the cons. Data, 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 where I started. Exactly. So we, uh, we know more about what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I see we're coming to the end of our session. There's still a few questions there. Uh, unfortunately, Temba just sent me a text and said, he does. oh, there he's back. Temba, mm -hmm. I have a very, very pertinent question for you. We don't have much time. The highest grade purple mesh goes up to is grade seven, correct? Question mark. Are there copyright issues with the printing of, of books? You've got 10 seconds. <laughs> One, yes and no. We have some of our schools that are using it up until grade nine because of the language tools and also the coding and robotics part of it. And then secondly, um, there aren't any restricted copyrights. Uh, it's not books, hence the printable feature to go ahead and actually print a, a, the whole, uh, like the entire book. So no restrictions on that. Okay, printable reading cards, anyone, both of you? Flash cards, I think that's how we started reading in early years. <laughs> uh, we, yeah. do, we, yeah, we do have some features within um, Purple Mash that one can create and add it or make it uh, part or as a supplementary resources. And there are also activities in terms of reading cards or flash cards as well, or pairing cards. So in Purple Mash, we do have that and they are printable as well. Well done. Mm -hmm. I want to stick to our time. I actually have to catch an aeroplane. I'm at the airport in uh, Nelspruit at Kruger um, Pumalanga International, and I've got to get okay. on a plane in minutes. The wonder of the internet. I work anywhere. Mm. Um, maybe just to summarize, and thanks, Ilza, for putting that up. Anyone can contact me if you want to get through to Snaplify or to Purple Mesh or Too Simple. But maybe just maybe. to summarize in small essence, I think. It's pertinent that we look at our own school's reading, reading results, reading diagnostics. Secondly, we've got to create a culture of reading. And I think both our speakers mm -hmm. spoke about that, that the parent has to be involved. Reading out loud days and International UNESCO Day. And we've got to work on those things. So um, at your school, from a governance, from a management point of view, make sure that you uh, address reading. Um, use reading results as one of the best marketing tools of your school. We always showcase our distinctions in matric. We showcase our rugby or sports or some other accolades. But if the whole country is sitting at 81% and your school is sitting at 12% or 10%, that's a great number. Use that as a marketing tool, but then you've got to know what that number is mm -hmm. and not just have report cards. So, so do the diagnostics, fix the problems, take the kids from where they are to where they can be better. And then, yeah, technology has many options for us. So, yeah, thank you, Ilza. You can um, flight that all the... All the um, uh, Contact details of our provincial managers, especially mine there in red. If you want to get through to um, me, email address, Rian at Fet.org, or my email, uh, my cell phone number is there. If you want to get hold of Temba or Tana, you can uh, just Google them, get through to them, or just speak to me, and we'll make sure that you've got contact. Mm -hmm.